Inshallah, if I can maybe kindly ask the brothers, if we all come close, yeah, it's a sunnah that whenever you sit for a lesson or anything like that, we come close, inshallah. Those brothers that don't need to be on the wall, trust me, the walls are okay. I've been, uh, I've been informed that the walls are not going to fall down. So if we all come, why those that come close, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He puts barakah in the gathering, you know? Where's the I can also kindly ask the brothers that no recording with mobiles, please. So no recordings with mobiles. Inshallah, the brothers, they're recording it. They're going to put it up on the internet. So if I can kindly ask no one to record. It's also important that when you come to a gathering, you come to a listen, try to put your phone aside. Wallahi, when the phone records, the mind is not recording anymore. Why? Because you think, Allah, I can, you know, I can play it back. Are we good to go? Yeah? Before I officially start, I just want to thank the brothers involved in this masjid that organized this and called me and... I want to thank also Brother Rabia Shamma, my Allah SWT rewarding. I also want to thank the White Coats, They're the brothers that are going to be doing the food, inshallah. So, White Coats. Zakallah Khairan. Actually, also, they also have, um, this is all done for free, so we're not charging you any money at so all. Please enjoy the food. But the brothers from the White Cuts have got a little box that they're trying to raise some money for someone that needs an operation soon. So if you want to help, please by all means try to fill it up tonight. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do it. Alright. Let me put my phone on silent first. Bismillah alhamdulillah. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the King, the Master, the Sustainer, the Creator of the seven heavens and the earth, and we send peace and blessings upon His beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My brothers and sisters, the biggest gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can ever give anyone, the biggest gift, the biggest present, and please, tonight, we're not here to be entertained. We're not here merely to, yeah, we were there, we heard the talk. And, well, we should sit here with a pure intention that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He opens our hearts. And with every story that you listen to, or every hadith, or every ayah that is mentioned, my brothers, the Quran is not a storybook. Every word is precise, every letter, every vowel is precise for you. So whenever you hear a story, you hear a hadith, you hear an ayah, apply this ayah to yourself, apply it to your life. When you hear a story of the Sahaba, don't just think, wow, you know, that the Sahabi did a great thing. No, you, you, should, you should think about yourself and say, what would I do? Or how can I apply this in my life? So my brothers, the greatest gift that Allah can ever give anyone is the gift of Iman. To be a believer, to be a Muslim. It's the pinnacle. For you to be a Muslim is an honor that no matter how much we speak about it now, you'll never know the Wallah, you'll never know its value. It's not until you stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of resurrection will you understand the value of La ilaha illallah. Today you have it for free. Really, most of us, you didn't pay anything for it. So you don't know the actual value of it, but you speak to a river. You speak to someone that was maybe in a, in a period of his life, he was a non-Muslim. Then he accepts Islam. You speak to him, then you'll understand the value of your deen. Such is the value of La ilaha illallah. Such is the value of La ilaha illallah. This word that you and I can say it now so easily, but we think nothing of it. If I was to tell you now, say La ilaha illallah. You think, that what's the value of it? Musa alayhi salatu was salam, very interesting prophet. An amazing prophet had a unique relationship with Allah. Again, I want you to live this story. Musa was a very unique, he had a 
The only Prophet that spoke directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there was no Jibreel in between. So Musa one day he asks Allah, he says, Ya Allah, give me a dua, give me a supplication. Give me something I can remember you by. But I want it to be unique. Oh. Ah. Oh. Habibi, I, I, I have to move, man. So unless I talk to you guys on this, it's not going to work for you, man. <laughs> I'm putting my muscles soon, man. Baby. Is the echo necessary? Where, where, where's the brother that's the... Is the echo necessary? So I feel like I'm the Imam of the Haram. <laughs> no? Alright, it's fine, leave it. It's fine, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, leave it. So Musa asks Allah, he says, Allah, give me a dua, give me a special supplication. But listen to the request. He says, Allah, give me a dua, give me something I can remember you by. Give me something that no other person has been given before me. And I want it to be unique, special, custom. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says to Musa, he says, Ya Musa, قُلْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Musa, say, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ So Musa thinks to himself, he says, Ya Allah, I already say, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ and every prophet that came before me said, La ilaha illallah. So, so Allah, I was hoping for something more, you know, customized for me, unique. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say to him? He said to me, Ya Musa, if the seven heavens and what it contains were placed on one end of the scale, and this kalima, La ilaha illallah, was placed on the other, this kalima, La ilaha illallah, would outweigh the seven heavens and the earth. But you and I don't know the value of that. But on the day of resurrection, Allah, you will understand the value of this kalima. You will know what it means to be a believer on that day. Allah, my brothers, the greatest love, the greatest gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give you is Iman. And it's unfortunate because let's be real tonight. Let's be serious. Let's not beat around the bush. How do you and I judge Allah's love nowadays? Even the religious brother. Even the person that's mashallah like myself, nice big gut and a nice long beard and a nice sunnah cap, mashallah, you know, very nice. Supposedly supposed to be a face of deen. Even this brother, deep down in our hearts. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't look for lip service. Rather on the day of resurrection, where will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look? At your lips or at what? At your hearts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to look at the hearts. Deep down in our hearts, how do we measure Allah's love? Let's be real. Allah's love for us, the measuring stick for Allah's love is dunya, man. How much dunya has Allah given me? Well, then that's how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you. Tell me what yimaru your car is, I can tell you how much Allah loves you. Tell me, are you renting or are you buying? Have you purchased your house or are you renting? Why? Because I can tell you how much Allah loves you. And now, I'm sure some brothers, nah, nah, astaghfirullah. Brother, please be real with yourself. Who are we kidding? Who are we kidding? Wallahi, my brothers, you know, sometimes it's difficult for us to grasp and to understand because the truth is we've been away. I know that we're Muslims by name, but in truth, we've been away from deen for centuries, our families, wallahi, have been so far away from deen that, you know, till now, till now, there are, there are still people who believe that being a Muslim simply means you pray your five prayers, you fast Ramadan, you give your zakat, and if you can go to Hajj, well then good on you. And that's it, and that's Islam. Sahaba never knew this Islam. Sahaba, they never knew this Islam. And that's why this particular hadith is so famous for us. The five pillars of Islam. The five pillars of Islam. Really in depth. We don't even know what that means. Go to any builder and tell him, brother, I've got five pillars. He says to me, yeah. What do you want me to do with that? If I said to you, look, I've got five pillars. Yani I have foundation. Does that mean I have a building? Does it mean I have a building? Brother, you got nothing. What do you have? You have foundation that now I can build on. But if that's all you're walking around with, that you got foundation, 
But you're claiming, look how beautiful my building is. Habibi, what building are you talking about? If you think, so, really, if you think Islam is just your five daily prayers and giving your charity and fasting Ramadan, if you think this is what Islam is, the Prophet of Allah, he says, Bunyan Islam, that Islam was established. <coughs> yani these are the foundations. Then Islam is built on that. We measure Allah's love based on dunya. Allah gave him kids, Allah didn't give me kids, therefore Allah must hate me. They've been in the country for 20 years, they've already bought a house. I've been in the country for 40 years and I'm still renting. Allah must hate me. I'm driving a 99 model car, the brother's got a 2014 car. Allah must hate me. Allah hasn't opened his doors on me yet. My brothers, if dunya is the measuring stick to measure Allah's love, I hope you're paying attention. If dunya is the measuring stick that we can measure Allah's love, then Allah hated your prophet more than anyone on this earth. Would, any, would anyone in this room accept such a statement? Can you even say that Allah hated his prophet? Habibullah, khayra khalqillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testifies in Quran, never mind, I love you. Allah says you're the greatest creation I ever created. Yet when you look at the dunya that you and I were wasting our lives with, when you look at this dunya that we've sold our deen, we've sold our akhirah for, and be real, we've sold our akhirah. Bal tu'thiruna al-hayat al-dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says amazingly, do you choose this life after the year after? Do you really choose this life over the year after? What an amazing question. Allah says, well, what's, what's going on? Where are, where are the brains? Where is the logic? If dunya is the measuring stick, then what? Then really Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hated our beloved prophet the most. <coughs> Why? Quran. His wife Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, our mother, she narrates to Urwa, her nephew, in the Sahih Hadith, and please listen my brothers and my sisters too. I've been told that there's over 50 sisters. Tonight I want everyone to listen and tune in. Many of the sisters, you know, they always tell me, I wish I could be married to the Prophet of Allah. Oh, isn't that cute? <laughs> and your husband, and you can't live with him. And he barely prays. Oh, it would be so nice. Really, would it be nice? You know what is the number one fact for divorces nowadays? Anyone know? Anyone know? Finance. Finance. So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she's saying to her nephew Urwa, she says, Wallahi my nephew, by Allah, we used to view the full moon, then the full moon, then the full moon, Two complete months used to pass us by. Two complete months used to pass us by. And not a single flame. Yani no cooking and no boiling of any sort. She says not a single flame would be lit in any of the nine houses of Rasulullah for two months consecutively. Urwa was amazed. He says, my auntie, how did you people live? She says to him, Al -aswadan al -tamru al -ma. We lived off dates and water for two months. Why? My brothers, you know, I don't want to take too much of your time. Our purpose on earth is not dunya. <coughs> dunya is not haram. I don't want anyone to misunderstand my message. Dunya is not haram. But dunya is not your maqsab. You're not he. You're not here for dunya. Don't think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be impressed whether you buy a house or you don't buy a house. This doesn't impress Allah. Don't think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be impressed with the ibahul of your car. This doesn't impress Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't care. You got married, you didn't get married, you had kids, you didn't have kids, how many houses, bedrooms, en suites. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't care about this stuff. لو كانت الدنيا the Prophet of Allah he says صلى الله عليه وسلم إن صحيح حديث so no one panic صحيح حديث 
He says, لو كانت الدنيا تعدل عند الله جناح بعوضة ما سك كافرا منها شربة ما. The Prophet of Allah says, if for argument's sake, if it doesn't, but if this world, this world that you and I we love, you and I we love this world so much. How many brothers they don't even attend Jumu'ah Salat? They don't attend Jumu'ah Salat. Tells me, brother, my boss doesn't let me go. What do you want me to do, man? Who's your boss? Who? Who's your boss? How many brothers that don't even pray their five prayers? Not because he doesn't want to pray him. He says, brother, it's very difficult at work. Habibi, are you alive so you can worship your work or you can worship Allah? Which one is it? Which one is it? Low care at the dunya, that if this world, for argument's sake, it equaled, let's say it had the value in the eyes of Allah, the wing of a mosquito. What's the value of a wing of a mosquito to any one of us here? What's the value of it? Two wings of a mosquito. What am I going to do with that? Not two wings, I could probably decorate something with it. But a wing, really, the wing of a mosquito, what am I going to do with that? The Prophet of Allah said, if it equaled in the eyes of Allah the wing of a mosquito, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have had given a single kafir a sip of water to drink. Yet look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving him. Cars and empires and businesses and palaces and women and power and status. Habibi, take it in abundance. Pharaoh who claimed, Pharaoh who claimed what? Pharaoh went straight to the top. He said, I'm God on earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened abundance upon him. Does that mean that Allah loved him? Is that how we measure Allah's love? <coughs> you want to measure Allah's love in your life, my brother and my sister? Ask yourself, where am I as far as these deen is concerned? Where am I? Where do you see? Look at our lives, my brothers. Wallahi, we've become so consumed in this world. It's incredible. It's incredible. You know, I find it amazing. <clears throat> I'm sharing this, you know, lately with the brothers. I say, you know, Allah, it's amazing. Some of us, we've reached 25, 30. Some of us are even older than 30 years. Older than 30. And you've been alive for 30 years, for crying out loud. You've been living for 30 years. And in 30 years, you still know the same three, four surah of Quran that you memorized when you were five, six years old. Still the same. You haven't increased them, not a single ayah. And Allah, I'm not even reading them correctly. But I ask you by Allah, 30 years of living, 30 years, some of us were older than this. Some of us are 40 and 50, we've got kids. 50 years of living and you haven't increased your Quran. Not a single verse. Yeah, and honestly, Wallahi, I find it interesting. What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your life? Brother says to me, Akhi, Wallah, man, you need to understand I'm busy. Habibi, busy with what? Why was I designed? Why did Allah create me? What, to live like others live? Is this the maqsad of my life? Hey brother, you need to understand. First you need to study, then you need to get a uni, then after you get a uni, you have to get job, you know, try to find a job, and then when you find a job, then you gotta work hard, then you gotta buy a house, then you gotta pay it off for the next 40 years, then after 40 years when you pay it off, then the house needs renovation, then you gotta renovate the house, and as soon as it's renovated, then I marry off the kids, and then I'm tired and I die, and thanks for coming. <laughs> But don't worry, Allah is Zafur Rahim, we are going to Jannah. Come on man, who are we kidding? Who are we kidding my brothers? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created us to worship Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created us to know Him, to call others towards Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Wallahi, the very reason you're alive, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you to establish deen in your life and deen in others. That's the purpose of your life. You came into this world naked, and you leave this world naked, and everything in between stays back. <coughs> Have you ever buried someone and you, and they took, you know, and that person took his belongings with him? Ever? What's consuming your life? What's consuming your time? You know, Allahi, my brothers, I find it amazing that there's brothers still, still till now, brothers and sisters still till now, they're not even consistent on their prayers. 
not be consistent on your prayers, man? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we still don't pray. I ask you by Allah, how is it that you still don't pray? How and when and where did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever fail you? Ever? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who created us from nothing. And He gave us our lives, and He gave us our limbs, and He gave us our families, and He gave us our home, and He gave us our... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who gave you everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who never failed you ever. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one whom your heart, your heart, every time it beats, it seeks permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Did Allah ever once say no to your heart? Did Allah ever once say no to your lungs? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever once say no to any limb of your body? Did Allah ever fail you once? Once, did He ever? Every single night when you go to sleep, your soul leaves your body. And in the morning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He replaces. He brings back your soul and He puts it back in. Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever once say to your soul, No, don't come back? So how can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one that's given me all this and the one that does all this for me, how is it that you, honestly, sincerely, you don't have 20 minutes in a 24 hour day. You don't have 20 minutes to pray and to thank you. You know your boss, he pays you what? Two, three hundred dollars a day if you're a tradie? Huh? Two, three hundred dollars a day? Your boss for two, three hundred dollars a day, he owns you for eight hours. He owns you. He tells you where the job is, he tells you what time to start and you don't open your mouth. For two hundred dollars a day, my boss owns me. But the one that created me and gave me everything that I have and gave me the things that are distracting me from Allah. And even that thing that's distracting you from Allah, Allah gave you that too. Some brothers tell me, man, I don't pray. I tell them, why? brother, my wife's too beautiful, man. <laughs> that wife that's so beautiful, Allah gave you that. <coughs> this is how we thank Allah. I don't have 20 minutes of my whole day to pray and thank Him. You know, my brothers, every single day the angel of death, he stares you in the face. Did you know that? But who stops him? Who stops the angel of death from taking your soul? Is it your money? Is it your employer? Who stops him? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, not yet. Give him more time. But give him more time to do what? Buy another house. Give you more time. More time to do what? Allah SWT says, give you more time. Maybe, maybe they'll wake up and repent. Maybe, maybe they'll wake up and come back to me. So my brothers, you know, I really don't want to drag this on for too long. I want to make my message clear that, you know, my brothers and sisters, our life in this world is so short. You don't have much time. Your plans and your dreams and your desires and your hopes and your ambitions, they far, far, far supersede the time you actually have left. Who knows the dua you make when you wake up? Who knows? It's in a hadith, it's a sahih hadith. No. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> or oh, praise be to the one. Just listen to the dua you make when you wake up. We teach it to our kids, but we have no understanding of it. We teach the hadith, we actually teach the dua to our children, but really no understanding of what's going on. So what's the hadith Akhi say? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Ahyana. When you wake up, the Prophet of Allah, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is the dua you make. All oh, praise be to the one. Alhamdulillah. Ahyana. That gave us life. Ba'dama. Amatana. Never mind what happened last week. This morning, every single one of you was dead. Who gave you life? What, your iPhone gave you life? Yeah, brother, I set the alarm, it rained. <laughs> Why, my brothers, every day in your life is a na'mah, is a blessing. <coughs> but we're wasting so much time. You know, in the last... In the last month, I buried maybe five, six brothers, all of which were under the age of 40. They're the ones I know about. Law Island, you know, there's always other communities and other people, you know, like that, that the news just doesn't reach you. 
few weeks ago, I buried my grandfather. My, and from what the family could agree, because you know those that came back then, there, no proper paperwork, so no one knows exactly how old he is yet. So from what we could agree amongst the family, we said the minimum, 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 he was 105. My grandma is persistent that he's 115. Based on, yeah, I remember when I married him, this, you know, so she's going off milestones and landmarks and... 105. And my grandfather was, wasn't a millionaire, but was pretty wealthy. In fact, my grandfather was old school, very old mentality, didn't even trust banks. Trusted no one, yeah? So he used to collect his money in cash. <laughs> so he used to collect his money in cash. So for those that come from the Arab world back then, they can understand why people thought like this, you know? So they don't trust governments and banks. And... So he used to collect his money, he used to put it in cash, and he used to put it in boxes. Then, because he trusted no one, wouldn't even tell his wife and kids where he would put the money. <laughs> <laughs> so that was fine, that was alright. Up until he lost his marbles and he didn't know what was going on. And we didn't know what was going on. Wallahi, wallahi. Money, Allahu alam how much. <laughs> no one knows where it is. <laughs> we want to knock the house down, man. We'll find it. But really, man, this money that he collected, of what benefit is it to him? Well, like, even his family couldn't benefit from it. 105, we buried him in Naked like the day he was born. And we also buried with him a baby that, that was a premature, like didn't even live an hour. And look, Allah shows you 105, and not even an hour old. And anything in between, Allah can take any time, any place, any how. He questions, Allah doesn't get questioned. And you and I, we still think, yeah, brother, I've got plenty of time. Habibi, my brother and sister, how much time do you think you have? Most of you, and who's older than 30? It's a difficult question, just raise your hand, my last, just be older than 30. You know what that means? According to the hadith of Rasulullah you've already gone over the halfway mark. You've already gone over the halfway mark. And we're still in cruise control. Brother, don't worry. You know, some of us think that the angel of death is going to shoot me an email. <laughs> Sounds funny, but really, this is how we deal with life. How many of us still get shocked when, oh, did you hear someone die? <gasps> did he really die? Yeah, what were you thinking that he's going to live forever? What are you shocked about? No, no, yeah, it's, no it's not that. But, yeah, it's not that, but what? I, oh, I just didn't think it was so soon. What do you think is going to happen? What? That the angel of death is going to shoot you an email? Say, hey, brother, I have a tip off, you know? <laughs> 27th, I'll be there. <laughs> Come on. Really? And you know what, subhanAllah, this is from Allah's wisdom that we don't know our date of death. It's from Allah's wisdom. You know if we knew our date of death? By no means am I trying to be funny, you know. If I knew my date of death, number one, I definitely wouldn't be here now. That's 100%. Number two, I definitely wouldn't have this beard. And I wouldn't be wearing these clothes. I would go out and do whatever I want, and then the Hajj before my death, I'll pack up, go to Hajj, repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, act all nice and humble, sit down in the masjid, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for istighfar and for forgiveness, and then die. Wow, such a nice death. And maybe if I die, I might have my finger like this. And everyone thinks I'm going straight to Firdaus al so my brothers, wallahi, your life is far more serious than this. What have you achieved in your life? What have you prepared for your akhirah? What have you prepared? You know, we've worked so hard on dunya, you know, we've worked so hard to establish our business or our families or whatever it is. We've worked so hard to establish it, but what have you prepared for the year after? <coughs> what have you prepared for that which is never going to end? What have we prepared for it? The month of Ramadan is what, that two, two weeks away? The month of Ramadan is two weeks away. 
What if you prepared? Sahaba used to get ready for Ramadan six months in advance. Six months. Six months. Six months. It shows you how keen and ready they were for it. Some of us, we don't even know what day, what day it starts. So please, my brothers, wallahi, we don't want to waste our lives. We don't want to waste our lives. Ask yourself sincerely, ask yourself, in the last week, what have you done for your deen? In the last week, what have you done? What have you done? How much, how much have you sincerely prepared? So please, my brothers, wallahi, our time on this earth is so short. And this dunya that you're working so hard for, I'm not saying it's haram, don't misunderstand me. But it's not your purpose, it's not the maqsad, we're not here for that. You're leaving, Habibi, you're leaving, trust me, you're leaving. If anyone was going to escape death, then surely it would have been Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But even he had to die. Please, my brothers and my sisters, my fathers and my... Wallahi, our fathers and our mothers, wake up, Ba'a, wake up. You know, uh, uh, subhanAllah, lately I've been doing some youth work here, yeah? and parents call me all the time. Brother, my son, brother, my daughter, these young kids, you know, the youth, you know, they've gone off the track, you know, they've lost their ways. So you get down there, you know, and you start mixing with the youth, and you know, like you start to see some shocking things. But you know what's more shocking? Is when you go to these houses and you see their mothers and their fathers, you understand. The basis of the puzzle that they, well, why they all come together? Brother, you know, like I'm telling you, you know, so many fathers, he tells me, you know, come see my son, he's a disobedient child. So you go there and you start seeing the kid and you start talking to him and thinking, you know, Akhi, talk to me, what's on your mind, what's this? And there's just this anger, man, there's just a lot of bottled up anger. Anyway, cut long story short, then, then at the end you start to realize, then brother, where's your father? And then the father, when I actually come to talk to him, Akhi, talk to me, what's happening? Brother, these kids, you know, this country has destroyed our children. You know, back home we went like this. I think, yeah, okay, all right. I've heard this song so many times. Brother, what do you do? Oh, alhamdulillah, you know, I'm working two jobs. One guy, he said to me, he drives a taxi. He says he drives 14 hours a day. One particular family, the kid's 16 years old, he hits his mother. 16 years old, punches walls, hits his mom. The father was angry, he asked me, look at this beautiful house. I built this house for my kids. And you know, I worked so hard to buy them nice things. I said, brother, you built a house, but you destroyed your home. You're working 14 hours, you know, 14 hours on a cab. Then who's going to raise your kid? Who did you leave that job to? Ah, uh, it's this country. Is it really this country? Brothers are working for 12 hour days. 12 hour days. <laughs> well, I'm saving you for a rainy day. Rainy day? What rainy day are you talking about? You know, I walk into homes and I see husband and wife. Husband and wife, they're living in the same house under the one roof. But really, they're living two separate lives. <clears throat> two separate lives. Brother works 10 hour days. Then comes home, he's tired, doesn't want to talk to his wife, doesn't want to talk to his kids. Then on the weekend, either he's fishing. Yeah, either he's fishing or he's going out. To, and, then, and, then, and then you think, that, ah, where's your life going? What are you doing with your life? Brother, I'll put food on the table. So please, my brothers, you know, I just opened another can of worms. But you know, please, wallahi, you know, where, really, where are you going with your life? What are you doing? Stop wasting your time. Wallahi, stop wasting your time. Death is around the corner. Death is around the corner, my brothers. Sahaba was scared of death. The Prophet of Allah was scared of death. And you and I, look at us, we're living our lives in cruise control. Brother, don't worry, relax. Allah is Ghafoor Rahim. Sahih Hadith. Wow. Brother, assist me, Akhi. Quran, wa rahmati wa si'at kulla shay. Let's give this guy a round of applause. My brother, you're so confident that Allah said, 
ورحمتي وسعت كل شيء and Abu Bakr and Umar ibn al-Khattab who were promised paradise they were scared and worried and concerned what يعني you understood the ayah better than they understood it sorry يعني what يعني your interpretation of the hadith was better than Abu Bakr's who are we kidding do you think that the day you stand before Allah is just going to be easy I think sometimes people think that it's it's Come the day of resurrection. Okay, where's... Hello everyone, where's the Muslims? Hey, that's Muslims, come over here. You guys gonna be all right? Where's the, where's the non-Muslims? Ha, 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 straight to hell fire. Muslims, it's gonna be all right. Who are we kidding? Sahih Hadith. The, sahih, sahih Hadith. The Prophet of Allah, he says on that day, it's 50,000 years long. 50,000 years long. One day, 50,000 years long. He says, you'll be naked, barefooted, uncircumcised. He was saying this hadith to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala. I said this hadith once in a masjid. So one of the brothers got upset. He says, my brother, how can you mention that hadith? Now I've got a 12-year-old daughter. Why are you mentioning this uncircumcised business for? I remember, you know, I was driving home. I actually felt bad. And I thought, hang on, if the best of akhlaq, the best of manners, Muhammad sallallahu if he had no problem saying this to his wife, why should I be ashamed to say it? The Prophet of Allah says that day you'll be bare, naked, barefooted, uncircumcised. Really, isn't that enough for me to tell you that you're going to be naked? Doesn't that already paint? Yeah, and if I told you, brother, you'll be naked on the day of resurrection, isn't that enough for you to paint a picture of what it's going to be like? But why did the Prophet of Allah feel the need to tell me, no, 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 you're naked, barefooted, uncircumcised. Because he's telling you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that even that little piece of flesh, even that piece of foreskin that left you when you were only a few days old, when they cut it off, you were a few days old, you were pure. But he's telling you, even that piece of foreskin that left you many years ago, even that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to replace because not an inch of you will escape him on that day. And brothers think, Akhi, don't worry, man. In the Sahih Hadith, the Prophet of Allah said, Man qala la ilaha illallah, dakhla al-jannah, relax, man. You people, you know, once you grow your beads, everyone becomes an extremist, you know. But <coughs> Akhi, I'm an extremist. Put me aside. But I just want to ask you something. Who, like, who understood deen better, you or Abu Bakr? Please, yeah, just help me answer this. It's not a trick question. Who do you think understands deen better? We, as people sitting here, or the Sahaba? Are you confident or you think maybe like it's a trick question? Who do you think understood deen better? Sahaba, yes? Why is it they were scared and you and I were not scared and we're not worried? Why is it that they were promised? Yeah, in the Quran, Allah said, I am pleased with them and they are pleased with me. And Allah said nothing to us. Yet they were scared and worried and where it's, it's cruise control, brother. Relax, I got this, man. Allah knows what's in my heart. Something's missing. We're taking our life far too lightly. So please, my brothers, you know, we need to wake up and we need to come back. And to wrap this up now, and I'm genuinely, I'm ending. You know, we've heard much, but what do I do now? Okay, brother, you've, all right, you've moved me, you've motivated me, you know, what do you want me to do? I say this, depending on your level of Iman and where you're at, because everyone's different, but this is what I say. I say, please, my brother and my sister, just do one thing from tonight. Choose one thing that's missing in your life and start it. But never leave it. We come, we get, you know, we hear these talks, we get so emotional, we leave the building, we're thinking tomorrow morning I'm gonna be what? Imam Shafi. Habibi, Wallah, that's not how it works. We need to stop being emotional people. All I'm asking is you do one thing, you promise yourself between you and Allah, you promise Allah one thing. And you promise Allah that you're never going to go back on this. And I don't care how small it is. Just as long as your promise is sincere, yeah, Allah, I will never go back. 
I'm going to start this or I'm going to stop this and it's a genuine promise. You know, my brothers, this is, you know, we need to understand what does Allah want from me? The Prophet of Allah, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, Allah loves the small action. Allah, Allah loves the small action that's consistent. Allah loves the small action that's consistent more than the big action that's a one-off. So I'll give you an example. Let's say we did a fundraiser and I got emotional. And, uh, yeah. Khalas. Brother Tengren. Wow, I got that beer. The brother walks out feeling like, what? Allah owes him something, you know? Don't forget Allah. Don't forget. <laughs> Some of us, you know, now, Wallahi, this is our attitude with Allah. One time, we had an event. Anyway, I don't, I don't want to say too much detail. But anyway, basically, the brother clearly did something wrong. We said to him, brother, please, you know, we've already advertised and whatever, so you can't do this. Brother said, yeah, but I've put money in this masjid. <laughs> so what does that mean? You put money in the masjid. What, what, what does that mean? What? That you've got special privileges? That Allah owes you something? Is that what that means? But I put money in the masjid. You know? So, let's say I gave the $10,000, but then I never did anything after that. Khalas. For the next 20 years, you know, and you know how many times I've met older brother? Alhamdulillah, you know, brother, I've done Hajj four times, huh? Four times. A'udhu billah min kilmat ana ba, you know, a'udhu billah min kilmat. What movie is that? You know, brother, I'm not praising myself. I'm just letting you know I did Hajj four times. Brother, that's praising yourself. And the fact that you just mentioned that you've just lost all the rewards. Did you do Hajj four times so you can tell me? So that you can impress me? Or did you do Hajj so that you can earn Allah's pleasure? Who did you do Hajj for? Some people, you know, they do Hajj and they come back and you don't call him Hajj Muhammad. Have you seen what I'm saying, they get? Tell him, uh, Uncle Muhammad. Uh, <laughs> Hajj Muhammad. <laughs> Tell me, whatever, man. Uncle, Uncle Muhammad. No, no, no. And then, then the smile, you know, you know, the first time you smile. Brother, I'm telling you, it's Hajj Muhammad. <laughs> so I gave $10,000 in charity, but they never ever gave charity again. And then someone else, he gives $5 in charity a week. Let's just say every Jummah he has a system in his life. Every Jummah he, you know, he never leaves a Jummah except he gives five dollars. Now you might think five dollars. Come on, man. Even a kid can do that. But that's our problem. How many Jummahs have come and gone, and you didn't even give that five dollars? Yeah, I'm sure there's been other times where you, where you did give some. But how many Jummahs passed you where you didn't give anything? So this brother he gives five dollars every Jummah and is consistent. And the brother ended up dying, and for many years he was giving the five dollars. But his five dollars, when you calculate it over the many years, didn't didn't add up to the amount of my one off ten thousand. His money is more is more beloved in Allah's eyes than my money. Why? Because he was consistent on an action that he didn't stop. I was one off. I got emotional. I gave the money never to be seen again. So whatever you do, I don't care whatever you do. Just make a promise. Make a move. And promise Allah subhanahu wa taala that Ya Allah, as of tonight, I'm going to stop this sin in my life. Oh Ya Allah, I'm going to start this good deed in my life. <coughs> and when you make this promise, when you make this promise, because now the month of Ramadan is coming up, I'm sure most of you are thinking, look brother, look, there's only two weeks for Ramadan, so let, you know, just, let's just act like, like these two weeks are. Well, no, this is exactly how shaitan works. If you don't start tonight, you failed already. You need to start now. Because Shaitan's going to tell you, look brother, there's only two weeks, let me clean up my next, you know, and then I'll start on the first day of Ramadan. Then come the first day of Ramadan, you know, because of the Sayyidah Ramadan, because of the night before, you stayed up until midnight, 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, because it's our last night before we start fasting. You ended up sleeping in for Fajr, and because you stepped in for Fajr, you wake up and you think, what? <coughs> ah, sack it, man, next year, inshallah. <laughs> How many Ramadans have come and gone and we, you know, and we promised Allah we didn't do anything? How many Ramadans have come and gone in the first few days? And you know what, then I'm sure in this message it's the same thing. The first few days the people are praying outside. Then after a week, 
There's no one here. Come the 27th night, they're praying at the neighbors. <laughs> then the Duhr for Wallahi, then the next day, no one's here. Juma, is it busy here for Juma? What's the numbers usually? Out, outside? Towards the back. MashaAllah. Exactly. Okay, beautiful. So that's a good number. Yeah, Juma is a good number. Then the Asr. I'm not going to tell you the next day. Brother, it's the next prayer. The same Allah for Juma is the same Allah for the Asr. No one's here. The old man comes, opens the door. Why? Because the bed. There's no one here. So, <coughs> I'm mentioning this for a reason. So when you make an intention, I don't care what your intention is, it's up to you. I don't know your life, I don't know where you're at in your deen. Make a solid intention, but here's the catch. Many of us, we make a beautiful intention, but usually what happens is we get emotional and the intention is re usually too big. So I'm sure there's someone here now is thinking, brother, you know what? He's right, I've wasted my life. From now on, Ya Allah, I promise you I'm going to read one juz of Quran every single day and the brother Benish, he struggles to read Fatiha. What's going to happen to this guy in his wife? He's going to come to read up his... So he'll come tomorrow, he's pumped, he's excited. He opens the Quran to read his first juz. He's going to buckle. So my brother, when you make an intention of my sister, be realistic. Do something you can actually achieve. You know, I would rather you tell me, brother, half a page of Quran. Imagine, honestly, be sincere. Imagine you committed to half a page of Quran and you've been doing it for the last five years. Where would your Quran be now? You'd be so much better than what it is, I'm sure. Uh -huh. So, we're going to make an intention. It's going to be reasonable. It's going to be a realistic intention, not something. Brother, barely prays. Brother, I'm going to pray my five prayers in the Majid every single day, inshallah, from now on. <laughs> Brother, all that's a nice intention, but just relax, guys. Please just sit down. I'm take a trip pill. Relax. You know, I'd rather you commit, you know, that look, inshallah, I know definitely, I know definitely. That Isha, it clears my work, it clears all my schedules. I know Isha, I can make no matter what. That's it. Then promise Allah, Isha, I will never miss. And what you need to do with your intention is, and this is the last thing that I want to mention, and this is the most important thing. With your intention, this is what you need to do. Because we're human beings, there's going to come a day where you don't read your half a page. There's going to come a day, natural man, there's going to come a day something happened, I couldn't pray my Isha. Now he's the path. We all make intentions, but none of us ever put a penalty to that intention. So you're probably thinking, what do you mean penalty? What, like a parking fine? Yeah, pretty much like a parking fine. And I'll tell you why. You need to know who your enemy is, and that's shaitan, and you need to know how he thinks. So this is what I say to the brothers. Let's say you agree to do half a page of Quran a day. So with your wa'ad, with your promise, you say, oh Allah, from this day forward, I'm going to read half a page of Quran. But Ya Allah, I promise you that when the day comes that I don't read my half a page, then the next day I'm going to read two pages and the half that I missed the day before. Not only that, but you should put yourself a penalty to pay in charity and it shouldn't be enough so that it breaks you, but it should be enough that it pinches you. Not, you know, I'll pay a dollar. Yeah, I'll pay $365 now, advance for the whole year, leave me alone. <laughs> no, no, it has to be enough to pinch you. That, you know what? Oh, man, I felt it. You know, Wallahi, you know, if you do this sincere, you know what's going to happen? You know, if we make intentions like this, you know what will happen? When the day comes that you miss your half a page, and Shaitan sees that the next day you actually read two and a half pages and you paid whatever amount of money it is in charity. You know what Shaitan's going to do? The next time you come to miss your half a page, by Allah, he's going to tell you, brother, please, you sit down. I'm going to bring the Mus'haf to you, inshallah. You sit down. He's going to bring the Mus'haf to you. He's going to open the you. He's going to tell you, please, please, just read your half a page. Because if you don't, tomorrow you're going to cost me two and a half pages and money in charity. You know? I'm happy with the half a page. You need to outsmart. So this is my reminder, inshallah. I just want to ask very quickly. I want some of the brothers to share their intentions. 
Don't give me a life story. And don't give me advice for the community. Just, there's a brother here that's happy to share one of his intentions that he starts, inshallah, as of today. Not, yani, not to expose, but rather, wallahi, to motivate one another, inshallah. Who's got an intention? Yusuf? Inshallah, I'll start reading the question. One page? Alright. I believe half a page, but if you're good, yani, if your Quran is good, then a page is very, very easy for those who their, who their Quran is good. And uh, how, 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 much, how much is the penalty? Hatta bjetti, I'm a man next to the penalty. Allah SWT reward you. Who else, inshallah? Who else wants to share an intention? Anyone else? Sure. No, I'm going to recite all my supplications after prayer. You want to do all your supplications after the salah? Wallah, this is the same thing. You know, if you just died on this, the Prophet Allah, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, whoever reads Ayat al Kursi after every salah, the only thing that will stand between this person and Jannah is death. These little things that we that we underestimate them. That's a massive thing. But choose a specific afkar that you're gonna do no matter what. And don't overburden yourself because we want you to stay steadfast on it. Who else in China wants to share an intention? If there's no one, I feel like I've wasted my time. I feel like this one hour has been wasted. You know, I drove five hours to get here, I had to exchange money on the way and stop the bike to bike twice and I pulled up petrol twice. <laughs> Who lives out here? Because I don't understand. <laughs> Please, I, 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 don't make me feel like I've wasted my time. I just want to see some of the intentions that we can move forward, inshallah ta'ala. Anyone else wants? The brother in the back. Wow. This, this, this sunnah is getting lost more and more, you know. What the salah is, even if you pray the one, Pray your water. Allah is so important. The, the uh, young brother. I want to learn a new surah. You want to learn a new surah? Inshallah ta'ala. And get married, yeah? <laughs> Who else inshallah wants to share an intention? Namafi. You want to be more consistent in sadaqah. You want to be more consistent in sadaqah. You know what I like? You know now some, some, some of these trustworthy, there, 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 there is trustworthy ones, believe it or not. But there is some trustworthy charity organizations where you can do like a direct debit. But what's good with that is that you know that even if I forget and I become, it's coming directly out of your bank account, right? And they can do it on whatever you want, like a dollar a day or five dollars a day, whatever it is. And then that way it's consistent. That way every day in the month of Ramadan you do the act of charity even though you're, you know what I mean? Because I'm sure you get busy or whatever. I think that's an excellent thing to do. Even, Allah, even, even a dollar a day, at least when you die, not a day in your life went by except you did the act of charity. So, Allah, that's an excellent one, man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. Sponsor an orphanage. You wanna? Sponsor an orphanage. Sponsor, mashallah. Orphanage is what the Prophet of Allah used to love. Yeah? Choose one that, that you like, that you trust, that you think is. But you need to be specific. You can do your extras, you know, like when work comes along and I get bonuses and I want to give, that's fine. But have a minimum. Yeah, no matter what, I'm going to send my $30 a month or, you know, what, what, whatever it is. Have your minimum and that's the promise that you make. Whatever you give extra, then that's between you and Allah, you know what I mean? What about small constant as well? Excellent. What, whatever it is. Now, Nafi. Fajr in the Masjid. Fajr, Wallahi. Imagine when you start your day with Fajr in the Masjid, it gives you an indication what the rest of the day is going to be like, you know? Right. The food is ready and I'm sure all of our intention is to go outside and eat food right now. <laughs> so once again, my last part, I reward all of the brothers and sisters involved. Jazakallah khairan, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa an. Asafiruka wa atubu ilayhi.